hashtag fix the country a non-partisan and non-political civic movement by Ghanaian youth for Ghana. They say they are demanding a new society founded on justice. They say they are refusing to play by the rules of a political class that is so disinterested in the Ghana project. And they are asking for a reset in the direction and the assumptions that pervasive immorality thrives on in Ghana's body politic. So it's been protest after protest, a sustained campaign to challenge the political establishment and chart a new course for Ghana. Fixing the country requires resources, the school, the roads, the hospitals, the bridges, etc. Which, which involves what we say socio-economic development and social well-being of the citizens of a country. But hashtag fix the country has as many critics as it has supporters if not more. There are questions about the group's goals, its philosophy and alternative plan for Ghana. And so I've come to meet one of its lead conveners, a PhD candidate at Cambridge University in the UK, who is currently standing trial over a ridiculous charge of treason felony in Ghana. We'll talk about the group and I'll challenge some of his views and approaches towards a shared development for Ghana. Oliver Mausi Baka Vomao is my guest. Thank you very much for joining us again. We're here with uh, uh, Fix the Country convener, Oliver Mausi Baka Vomao. And in the first part of our conversation, we've discussed quite a number of things, really. The aspirations of Fix the Country, his own personality, and the role that he has to play in Fix the Country, and also the question of structure and, and leadership in Fix the Country. Mm -hmm. What happened in, in, in prison cells? I mean, allegations of torture, you have made them yeah. at listen to one of your colleagues in Africa country ask this question on, on Joy FM yeah. and then he said that well he was not going to answer that question and that at, at the right time yeah. uh, you would address that question yourself. Yeah. I hope this is the right time. The words I use it, specifically in my address, I said I was tortured and subsequently detained. And then the media said I was tortured while in police detention. That's not true. No. Commander Osman, who was the commander of the I think it was perfect just he was working with a system that is inhumane. That's, 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 that's a very refreshing thing to hear. No, no, I mean, listen, I've met people, and perhaps, perhaps because it's Muslim, I don't know, I've met people who have uh, have their heads screwed on straight. And perhaps this would displease him, Hopefully, because he's always said that every time I say anything good about him, it puts him in trouble. Yeah, exactly. uh, and so perhaps I should be saying that it was completely horrible, because that's what the system likes. Yeah, yeah. But I think that it's a person who's of incredible faith and treated me with respect, even with the means which so you have to deal with. Who it was a coffee machine. To, uh, essentially now, abducted I said I was, yes, I was said I was tortured and subsequently detained. I arrived in this country around 5 p.m. Uh, on Friday 11th. And then I was detained by the immigration people. Uh, at about 30 minutes, persons in military fatigues, armed to the teeth, and persons who were plain clothes people, none of them were in police uniform, came to pick me up at the airport, at the Ghana airport. And for over five hours, I was held at the private person where I was beaten up, stepped on me, spat on me. I consider those to be tortured. For no purpose, there was no investigative uh, reason behind it. There was no, there's nothing. It was just, we want to beat you up. And these were persons who completely brutalized me. And this, I was, and so when I say I was tortured, subsequently, they this is what I mean. Yeah. Now, beyond that, when they were taking me at every point, I kept asking for names and I kept asking for the reasons why I was being detained. At no point was any of that given. Uh, I was handcuffed and put into a into vehicle, surrounded by persons who were armed to the teeth, and I was I was blindfolded and was being driven out of the blindfolded. Yes, being driven out of the airport. Wow. Uh, and and I asked the question to them severally, where am I being taken to? And every time I asked the question, I was slapped for it. And I genuinely believed that I was going to be killed. I had no idea where I was being taken to. In fact, when we started driving out of Accra, I could only sense yeah. that we were no longer in Accra because there was no traffic. So I could tell that perhaps this is the motorway. And my, my instinct was that this was being either those Bundasi or any of those places where I was going to be killed. I genuinely believed that. And then we eventually parked at a point, and then we're, we're, again, we hit traffic again and then parked at some point. 
for a while, it was and this thing. It took me a minute of, you know, reorienting myself before I came to realize it seems like this is a police station. Even then, I didn't know which police station it was. Now, when I was flying to Ghana, I had made a post where I was talking about how I anticipated I was going to be arrested by the police. And I, knew and I came down there. I, I believe that. The, the, be yes. Too. When I, I was transiting through Portugal, and I called my lawyers on the phone, and I said, this is going to happen. So two lawyers were at the airport waiting for me. One was at the airport police station. Saying that, okay, if this is a democracy, and I made a post that, forget about whether or not people think my language is democratic or not. People can disagree on that. But let, let's, let's watch our democracy as whether or not it's going to respect my basic human rights. I, I was then presented to the police station, which, was, which has jurisdiction over the airport, when I was arrested. And, and they were there. And then they couldn't hear anything from me for, for how many hours. And for which reason, a statement was issued that I had been missing. It took 4 a.m. when the police responded, claiming that, in fact, I had been arrested. And when they did, they claimed that I was being held at the Tema, Tema Regional Police Station, which was true, which was untrue. In fact, they misdirected people as to where I was, in fact, being held. That which my lawyer spent the whole day, Saturday, trying to find me where I was. This is not a country which is committed to a, democ a, a democratic conversation about respect of rights. And so when I say that this is a few persons without morals, I genuinely believe that way. Now, when I was held in, 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 in police detention, and I'm going to say this for the first time as well. Uh, when the police issued a statement, yeah. they said I was going to be arraigned before court on Monday. Mm -hmm. Essentially saying that they were going to breach the constitutional right to be brought to court within 48 hours. Right. And when my lawyers came there, the Trump Power was there, and all, all the other lawyers, uh, Justice, Dr. Justice side, came there and pressed them on the need for me to be released in 48 hours or brought before a court. What the police instead did was that they must up security presence. They brought more, you know, right control vehicles, just militarized the place and put out sirens, barricaded the place, uh, claiming that they, that uh, people were going to try to break down the police station to try to release me. Again, this, this, these are choices were made by persons who are deliberately trying to create fear and trying to create a sense of military so people cannot hold them to account. So not only that, on the night before I was taken into court, at around 10 p.m., they introduced a gentleman who I believe worked in the national security, or perhaps any of those shady in this, at around 10 p.m. to come into my cell. And when I was lying there, and in fact, one of the things I told myself when I went into the yeah, cell, when I went into the cell, no, I'll get there. The person who came yeah, I'll, I'll come to it. When I, was, when I went into the cell, one of the things I told myself was that if I cannot convince these people in here to believe in the cost of the country, I was going to stop my activism. By, by, by that Sunday evening, these were persons who were singing Arise Ghana Youth for your country, who were chanting Free Oliver for your better Ghana. Now, around 10 p.m., this injured man then was introduced into the cell around 10 p.m. And instinctively, I told the guys who were sitting with me, I think this guy is in the national security. Because, I mean, already the military presence outside, and I to think that they were bringing somebody new, I just instinctively said that. And so they were kind of had their doubts. So they kind of brought in their cell leaders as well, who were in quite kind of questioning the guy, uh, trying to, you know, shake him up and see what it is. He was, was we're asking him questions. He claimed that he been, he was from, he, he was an importer who his check had bounced, and so he had been arrested. And so I asked the guys, which bank opens at 10 p.m.? So they said he should wait there. Now in the cell, what happens is that the police have an arrangement with the cell leaders, where when you're coming into the cell, the cell leaders have divided the cell up, where they call a part of the cell Zongo. Um, yes, and where the vast majority of the people are packed in. Because people can't be in the cell anyway, so they push them in there. It's like if you have seen pictures of the slave ship, that's how the people are arranged in, that, in the cell. And there's a small part where the leaders sit, where they, at least they can stretch their legs. And, and when I came in, I mean, I came the same reaction. So they found out I was a lawyer and everybody wanted to come and tell me their trouble and how they needed legal representation. Persons who had been arrested and not been taken to court in 12 days. Like, you know, even when we were making noise about my 48 hours in there. And persons who had not had any meal for days in there. So they were kind of just telling me the problem. They got a book I was writing, all these things down. And so when the guy came in, they asked him, they said, okay, you, this is a selfie. You need to pay a selfie of 200 cities to join this side or be in the Zungo. Then quickly the police shouted that they all, he has already paid the money to them. So the people then started doubting whether or not he was. So I told them that just as of this thing, put him in the zone. So they made him go and lie there. You know? And every small time he would 
come up to come and complain this thing. Trying to get access to where I was sitting and the people pushed him back. Then after some minutes, the commander of the police, uh, of Ashaman police, came down that the guy had left his bread, so they were bringing the bread to him. So they, the guys took the bread, and I was lying down sleeping. And then, the, as the guy was taking the bread to the guy, something told him to just press down on the bread. And when he pressed down on the bread, there was a knife and a phone in the bread. And so they, I was just like, I didn't even know this. So the boys just started running to me and congratulating me and holding me that, wow, hey, thank you, this thing. They called me father and they, thank you, father, this, blah, blah, blah. And still didn't know what the whole is, because a lot of them were speaking Hausa, and I which I don't speak. And so they would confer among themselves and come, this thing. So then there was decision was made. They, were, they, were, they had discussed themselves what to do with the phone. Eventually, they decided to consult me. So then I said to them, my feeling is that this device is already recording you. So the best thing is that take a bowl and put it put it in water. And one of them said, no, you know, we can pass it to a brother. He'll go and sell it. What was it? I said, no, you don't want to do that. So we had a back and forth. And eventually, one of them just got angry. Then hit the phone down and started, broke up and destroyed the phone. And I asked for only part of the phone, which was the serial number of the phone, and the SIM card that was in it. And I did it, and with their help, they used a blade to cut. I was wearing like a jumper, which is like a warmer from when I was on the flight. Part of it, and they hit that in there. And then, then now, then the question of how do we dispose of this? And so then decided to tie it up in a polythene bag, which they did tie it in a polythene bag. And then put it in there, because they come for the rubbish from the cells like 5 a.m. Okay. So put it in the rubbish. And so around 5 a.m., they came for the rubbish and took it out. Then around 6 a.m., the guy, throughout the night, the guys had told me, you know what, we used to be uh, land guards. We can keep watch over you. We're not going to sleep. So you sleep. So they formed a protective wall around me and were fanning me. And some were watching and keeping the guy. You have to lie down. And any time you try to raise his head, they pushed him back down. All along, what, had, what, what, what was he saying? He, he was trying to protect his nose. In fact, he had an ear thing in his ear, which he threw out into the back, bathroom. Mm. where they tried to say there's no light in the cell so they tried with difficulty to try to retrieve which they couldn't it was protecting his innocence all throughout the night in the morning after this the there were about five police officers or persons I'm the, where right now the police were fatigued which you can't even distinguish whether the military or police came in cells with the crime officer of the Akshama police station first somebody came to call the guy out and when they took him upstairs they went to debrief him and realized that he didn't have the phone or any of the things they had been sent into the cell with and, and then they came down armed to the teeth, cut, tossing up the cell. Where is the phone? Where is the phone? Where is the phone? And everybody was saying, which phone? We don't know about any phone. Eventually, they did all the things. They weren't speaking to me at all. I was just quiet and looking at them. And they were dealing with the other thing. Eventually, they arrested two of the cell leaders in the cell and half of them and took them up. And the guys started crying that you guys are going to kill us. What, what? So when they got there, from the fear of the thing, they told them that about how we've thrown the, the phone out. And then they came back with them went to take the rubbish and came to retrieve the remnants of what it had been destroyed. And, and eventually, when my, the time my lawyers came, I was able to s sneak out the SIM card for them to check whose name it was registered. Unfortunately, they had already disconnected the line, even, even at that time. Now, again, tell me which part of this is reflective of a country which is committed to democratic values. After I said that I was tortured and subsequently detained, the Attorney General, of, the Deputy Attorney General, yeah. uh, certain Yeboah, who I don't know who he is, came out and said, claimed that I was claiming there has to be air condition in the cell. And even, even though I have, been, I have talked about the inhumanity in the cell themselves, which in fact in, in international law constitutes torture, because mm -hmm. you're living persons within, without dignity. I wasn't even referring to that. I was talking about the brutal conduct which they, don't, they know about but don't want to acknowledge. Now, he is going about and talking about uh, uh, air condition in the cell, yeah. with the, and sidestepping the questions of the inhumanity in which people are subjecting into ourselves. The fact that people are not being fed in the cells, and when in the past we've talked about people who are not being fed in our cells, the police have issued a statement claiming this was false. When in fact they know this is true. Something Anyani Ney talked about when he was going to court, yeah. and that the police officer, the CID, was saying that they have to pay money from their pockets. I mean, a lot of people have shared. Their and so many people have shared stories about these things. But for me, the bigger problem and the bigger question about democracy that a state institution would issue a statement lying in order to protect persons in government. This is the height of the fact that we are not, in, we are not a democracy. 
And these are problems which we should not overlook. I, I want us to talk about our institutions then, because I mean, this thing you talk about is really, really revealing. And, and I suspect that for many, except of course those who are skeptics for, for the sake of it, you would believe it if you have encountered um, our, our institutions and all of that. Our institution, and I mean Ghana broadly, still lives within the, the colonial setup, okay? So, I mean, let's look at our institutions. And I know that yesterday or so was the, the Queen's birthday. You watch them, I mean, send congratulatory messages to, to, to her and wish her good and all of that. I mean, forget about the fact that from the Chief Justice to our President to many of our grandparents, yeah. we were all subjects of hers uh, yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure the first time she was consummating her marriage with the late uh, Prince Philip, many of these people who are today going to be celebrating her were all yeah. subjects of his. Yeah. And Ghana was, was a property of his, but that was for another day. It's not in doubt that we inherited a deeply colonial regime and what its, its institutions. What are your, your thoughts on how to decolonize the general mindset? Because if you are unable to do that, every other thing that we are talking about here would, 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 would prove futile. Yeah. I want to add a, a little bit to what you said and then talk about how we decolonize mindset. You know, I, it's, it's funny to me that one of the big things this political tradition in place now celebrates is a, a reactive decision which ended the preventive detention. Act. And they make a whole thing about it yeah. to invite uh, this uh, Minister of Injustice to come and give a whole presentation. They, they'd like to talk big and, and about values and whatnot. And one of the biggest things that Nkrumah is criticized for is the Preventive Detention Act that allows the government to hold persons without charge or, or trial in, in, in cells. Now, I was, I was arrested on the, uh, and, and then told caution that I was being investigated for a misdemeanor, mm -hmm. which is conduct offensive to the breach of peace, yeah. claiming that the language you've used would, would provoke the military to overthrow the government. Like, I said, they're children in the military. But that's beside the point. Maybe they are. Perhaps they are. Now, they, they then caution with this. Don't formally charge me with the offense. And you're supposed to charge a person before you present them to court. I was presented then to court. Uh, at and then in the morning, they, they come and inform the court that, in fact, no, the offense is a uh, treason felony. Offense I had not been cautioned in respect of, I had not been charged in respect of. And for 35 days, I was held without charge. That's the Preventive Detention Act, which we were criticizing. That you're able to hold a person without any charge, claiming that you're just investigating, and hold a person in, in, in jail for that long. And in fact, asking the court to renew if, it. If you deceptively do so, it amounts to the same thing, in principle. In principle, you've, you've exactly done that. And so the whole ethos of the colonial infrastructure we have not dismantled. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to couch what we are doing as, in fact, liberation it has to be understood. Because that's the same set of institutional arrangements that we continue to keep in place. Now, how do we do this? You know, there's a certain strong nostalgia for oppression that our people have that I do not understand. And it's deliberate because it serves a, a certain political class. So many young people even talk about, have talk about, you know, maybe we should be recolonized again yeah. and things like that. And it hurts my, it hurts me because we haven't created, you know, imagination beyond. My real belief thing is that there's so many people who have checked out from the project of believing that we can reform our democracy and be better that you cling to the past that even gave you bread. It's like even in the aftermath of slavery, Persons were saying that at least with my master I had food to eat. Because it's not economically liberated people as well if you've given them political freedom. And that's the kind of sense we have created that because people have not seen governor that is committed to their well-being, they can only look abroad and see that those people are living well. We could perhaps have lived well if we decided to remain under them. And so if governance has failed, because we have failed in our governance and our ability to create faith in what we can achieve, that's the only way that you're going to get and tan connected with this is where people hear people say you, you shouldn't die for Ghana or Ghana is not a country to die for or things like that. It's a real sense that there's, no, there's nothing about this country that is worth giving or sacrificing or giving oneself for. Yeah. And, and to change that we have to create people. People have to believe in a new project. Yeah. A lot of times people have asked for the country. When we came up with the things that eventually synthesized the demands and we said we think that we have to have a 
constitution that speaks to a new generation. And we're saying a new constitution for a new generation. That puts it on the path of solving key generational, you know, interests and concerns going forward. We said we wanted a development plan that really disciplined the political class better and kept them in check. But one of the things we talked about was that we wanted a truth and reconciliation process. Because we've used truth and reconciliation to, to catalog the excesses of the military era. But we have not done this to review what you have the years of this democracy. People have real pain in this democracy. And they have to go on camera and speak about those pain. Yeah. That's the only way we can heal. Yeah, there's, a, there's a certain impression that we have created there. And, and I mean, it's the same critique that you get with post colonialism yeah. and all the post analysis that at some point something has ended. Yeah, absolutely. So for instance, if we had reason after 1992 to, to have a reconciliation commission, yeah. the presumption is that now that I we said. are in a democracy, all of those things have ended. Yes, but then again, the question really comes down to what the democracy is. But there's, there's a point that Professor, the late Professor uh, Kwesi Redu, yeah. one of Africa's eminent Absolutely. philosophers, talks about uh, in, sh sad thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sad in, in democracy by consensus, where he, I mean, makes the case for a more indigenous version of democracy because then we are more relatable to that right. and appeals to to the realities of a social uh, situation and cultural situation. In his case, he wants a political system or democracy that has parties in the sense of people who are interested and are, are, are participating in the development process, but not party in the sense of opposition right. or adversaries in right. the NATO for MPP, NDC. Right. But then again, he also does not want a a, a partyless society right. or one party society. Right. What do you imagine to be an alternative to what we have? Right. Because ultim ultimately, if it's the same thing, yeah. then obviously there's, there's nothing new. So here. you know, one of the I I, wrote, I remember I wrote the post that when I was uh, I was the young I was the youngest in the Constitutionary Recommission mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, it was like in early 22 or something. And there was a gentleman who had come before the commission and said. We didn't need a democracy. We needed a oman, omandocracy, uh, which is the love of oman, nation. Omandocracy. Okay. Oman okay. okay. And we would love for days about it. And I wrote a post recently where I said, I'm apologizing to that individual because he was ahead of my time. Yeah. That I hadn't sufficiently reflected on what he was trying to get across. I think that there has to be a serious rethink of the structure we have created. And this is why I think that a lot of people who are talking about sporadic amendments of constitution here and there do not understand the problems we're dealing with. That we have to sit down and restructure our society towards a vision. And if it's about textual changes here and there, to clarify language here and there, to separate Minister of Justice from Attorney General, all those you know, superficial things that middle, middle class Ghanaians like to put across, then we haven't really thought about how we can reposition society differently. I'll give an example. One of the things which we talk about, about trying to hold our political class to account, is that the difficulty of that there's no mechanisms in place. Where there was a mechanism, which is about the Electoral Commission, impeaching the Electoral Commission, we invoked that process. And I think that if we really want to make people a part of it, we have to create a structure that at every point, there's a way in which humans or the people themselves can act as a direct check. We've made that gamble on institutions, and politicians have understood that all you have to do is that fill those institutions and, and corrupt those institutions. Now, Create different mechanisms where people can directly come into the process and do that. Recall elections, all kinds of different ways in which we can really complexify our democracy that makes the people not dormant, but actually have a place to play in that. A, a, a false impression that you are you are a part of it. Yes, create a, a real framework for where people feel like it's a part of it. That I can actually do this and this would work. Like, and that's one of the things I've always do, done, even with the current limited options we have. That people say, oh, okay, if you ask for a democracy, the police are going to, uh, demonstration, the police are going to say no. We say, let them. They did. Then we said, okay, we, we're challenging it. The law says, you know, we don't even need your permission. We don't need your permission. They say they are going to court. We say we are going to the Supreme Court. People say, oh, if you go to the Supreme Court, you're not going to win. We say, hey, well, let them. We do it. Right? Like, so every aspect, if there's a mechanism that can be triggered, we trigger it. We want more of those things infused into the democratic process. Now, I suppose every society can only survive if people feel a certain proximate relationship with it. In terms of it's close to their way of life and the way in which we live. I don't know whether or not where the way in which people imagine it, infusing like the traditional authorities and institutions 
into the process is the way to go. But I genuinely think that they haven't shown themselves to be very democratic. They are, they are not accepting of criticism. They don't account. They are one of the, you know, they, have, they perhaps for survival will allow themselves to be embedded in the structures of corruption themselves. Now we need to have genuine conversations about them. But I, as a Democrat, I'm suspicious of any institution or word which becomes a taboo or it's so sacred that we can't talk about. Mm -hmm. And if our chief and institutions want to remain that, they have no place in a new gun. They have to reform themselves. A, a final bit, and then we'll, we'll move into the, the, the second half of this. I want us to really talk about the, the, the constitution and, and all of that. You have called the Supreme Court of Ghana a, quote, branch office, and I suppose that is to the ruling uh, government. I mean, there are many things that we have seen, especially in recent times, mm -hmm. political I mean, cases, and the way they have gone, the results of which have been purely absurd. And you're not the only one who has criticized some of those things. Professor Kukwa Sare and many other people have, have done the same. If you look at the current chief justice, mm -hmm. and even those before him, and his very casual way of invoking some colonial sentiments. Yeah. If, for instance, uh, has a problem with a professor of African studies who appears before the Supreme Court not wearing suit. Yeah. People don't see how much of a big deal those yeah. things are. Yeah. It favors wearing wigs that the British themselves have stopped, yeah. and many other things like that. But of course, in critiquing people like them, we need to be able to also disentangle that from the institution itself, because the institution would outlive them. If you say the kinds of things that you say yeah. about the court and not the individuals, mm -hmm. aren't you creating a problem more ultimately? You know, one of the things which has become really difficult in our democracy now is how we deal with the court. As a, of, of a person, as a person who is of a person, perhaps unfortunately a legal training, I genuinely want to look to the court as a, as a place, as a safeguard of our democracy. Almost entirely your other colleagues don't think like that and it's, it's, it's a miracle how that happened. <laughs> you know, lawyers that have met, uh, yeah. uh, even law students are the most uncritical people that I, I could have. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and that is the thing. Like in the same way I was talking about the military, that they have to remember that the judiciary is not a preserve of lawyers. It's a part of our democracy. That the people must have access to it and must criticize it itself. And it is only through that process of critical regard over the judiciary can we really improve it. Now, the persons make up the institution. Okay? You can create something fantastic on paper. In fact, when we're doing the Constitution Review Commission, I was the researcher in charge of the judiciary brief. And I looked, so many times I look about this thing on paper and I'm saying, I cannot tell why this thing continues to operate the way it does. Because mm -hmm. we, like if you read the Constitution Review Commission report, so many times we say, the problem is maybe not with the constitutional language. It is how it's been operationalized by the people. Mm -hmm. So like, you're at, at which ends trying to find what it is. Now, this current Supreme Court, I, this current Supreme Court, and with the current justice, I think has been the worst for Ghana's democracy. And I should be able to say it without fear of reprisal. Exactly. And the fact that so many lawyers are unable to do this tells you that it's a problem with our democracy. Now, I have called them the party branch office. And I say this because I'm, I'm sarcastic in my approach in, in dealing with institutions. And I think that satire has a place in, a, in reforming democratic culture. Even under the PNDC, our judges was one of the, were one of the boldest. And perhaps the PNDC had a certain shyness of the judiciary after the killing of the judges, yeah. that they were tentative in dealing with them that we got through that really, really brave judges. In fact, when we filed, when my brother filed a habeas corpus application on my behalf, a judge was asking whether the habeas corpus is still available since the 1992 constitution. Like we were issuing habeas corpus, the judges were issuing habeas corpus left, right, center, even under military era, right? Even when Nkrumah was overthrown, a 16 year old boy that the military claimed that he had been sent from Guinea to come and overthrow them. <laughs> it's like they issued a habeas corpus, the military re arrested, and they issued it again. Like the judges were very, very brave. Now we have, a, we have a judiciary now which you would think that their instinct is to find a way to please the government. And I've generally criticized the, our judiciary that they have a conservative thing to them, that they're always thinking to side with the government. So you're arguing not only against the attorney general, but you're arguing against the court yeah. whenever you appear before them. But in this particular case, I don't know whether the fact that this is the first time in a democracy that one president has appointed almost the entirety of the Supreme Court that has created this dynamic. I don't think that it's as facile as people saying that, oh, because they are all president, political appointees, that is, that is why. But one has appointed the entirety of the Supreme Court, and they were some of the most brave ones. In fact, he appointed persons who were critical of him. 
You appoint the persons of not of a political. You talk about the personalities and the person, about. Right. You know. So these are persons who are different thinking. But we have created a court where we we are refusing to accept criticism. That we talk about them. That saying that no, I cannot make sense of your judgment. That neither law nor logic can explain it. That people are inclined to think that you're only doing it for partisan reasons. You say no. Then what should what is left to people to explain your decision? They can go to so many things. Is it religion? Perhaps it is religion. I'm saying that if the you know students, I've done a thing where I talked about the number of Christians on our court and the fact that there's very few Muslims and it's not representative of the diversity of religious diversity. That is a problem for our country. You know, I've talked about a court which is filled with persons who have done either Wesley girls or whatever it is. It is not reflective of the social upbringing of this country. All those things have a role to play in the way in which you know people bring different thinking onto the court, and the monotony is there. These are persons who have collaborated with persons in government and the political, particular political tradition. I'm not saying that persons who are openly partisan have no place in our court. They can appoint the former mem member of parliament. Must be, but there has some fidelity to. There has to be a certain fidelity to certain principles that are drive our democracy. Now, I want us to Oliver focus on this key aspect of your advocacy so far on the need for a new constitution and even on this subject you obviously have had to disagree with some of the most progressive minds in this country who support you and believe in almost every other thing that, that you do so i want to start on this note the the indian uh, historian and best-selling author a very critical voice also on british imperialism uh, dr sashi taru in denouncing, uh, I mean, a colleague and, and fellow Indian, the novelist Arundhati Roy, on the question of what to do to transform a nation, India. said that, quote, denouncing the entire system is not a useful way of addressing the problems. Yeah. We can strongly fight the illiberal elements without saying the entire system is bad, end quote. But surely, it's an advice for you because of your very own position on the 1992 constitution. Yeah. Um, I really I like Sashi, Sashi Taro. Uh, uh, he was at the UN. He yeah. was tipped to be UN Secretary General. Mm -hmm. Didn't get it, went back to India and now with the Congress Party. I have friends, friends of mine from Harvard who are the Congress Party. So I follow Indian, in the Indian politics mm -hmm. quite a lot. Uh, I mean, after all, it's the biggest democracy. And, and I, I, I completely believe, I, I, I agree with him. Um, you know, That's not I don't deal with the constitution. Yeah. No, I. You see, so this is the distinction we ought to make: that the constitution is not the entirety of our system. It does create a framework, but it's not the entirety of it. Now, I do not vilify. I love the Ghanaian constitution. I do not vilify the constitution um, because we need something to attack. But I also say that the fact that we have called for a new constitution doesn't mean that everything that is existing in the current constitution must be thrown away. Okay, and I'll explain why. One of the things I've said is that if you look at the 1992 constitution now, yeah. it has remnants of things that existed uh, in colonial constitutions, yes. right? Like the framework where they said parliament cannot introduce a money bill, like it's something that imposes a financial charge, mm -hmm. was the way in which the coloni colonial system was controlling the legislative council that has put in place so that they don't act. Yeah. Prevented uh, the situation right. where the citizens will bring anything that and will challenge their Exactly. Case. We have that in the current constitution. We've preserved it till now. I mean, we would have elements, this bill. Right. That's, that's an yes. element in there. We, we have elements of it from the 57 constitution, the 69 constitution, uh, 79 constitution. Meaning that we have preserved parts of those constitutions. And I say it, even if I disagree with some of the things that Ghanaians know how to preserve certain things that they like about certain things and change as along the path. So when we are saying we are calling for a new constitution, it's not that we dislike the entirety of the constitution. But it's both also not only about substance but at the process. One of the things we have said is that when you look at the constitution review process, yeah. we have 211 suggested amendments. Okay. The, we tried to do a two bills. One amendment bill that amends the entrenched provisions, one that amends non-entrenched provisions. The system, the status quo took the view that you can only bring one amendment bill for one issue using some language in the constitution which can be interpreted to go both ways. Meaning that we need 211 amendment bills. To send 211 bills through the process, I think it will take an average of three years from initiation to end for those that will go through referendum to be able to amend a part of the constitution. 
meaning it will take 633 years to change the things which have I, we had identified then to do. How is that feasible and realistic? How do we not end up creating a disjointed constitutional framework? The second thing I'm suspicious of is that when we go into the framework of thinking that a few amendments here and there is the way to go, we create a situation whereby we are thinking linearly rather than structurally. So for instance, in my conversation with, with a f f colleague who had asked me, give me 10 provisions of the constitution that needs to change, yeah. I said no. I can rather think of 10 frameworks. What are we trying to achieve with this? Mm -hmm. And how is it not working? So let's restructure it. So instead of saying elect DCs, then change that constitutional provision, I want to rethink the, cons the, the decentralization framework yeah. completely and say, OK, we've tried this approach. It re-centers power at the top. Maybe we can, the Americans call their federal system, like it gives for experiment, democratic experiments in 50 different states yeah. for the federal. Maybe we can think of repositioning them and creating inter, you know, provincial competition between them. Yeah. We can develop new politicians within the provinces. The persons then can, you know, aspire to some, you know, provincial attorney general or certain things mm -hmm. that create new crops of leaders that are managing their, this thing. That citizens in province A can look to province B and say things are moving, are moving on well because they are managing their things differently. So we can rethink the structures. But what about who, whose ideas are these, really? Because I'm, so this is one of the things yeah, I say. I, I'm also cautious of yeah. a situation where you. I mean, this look very fine ideas, yeah. but you you may create a problem where tomorrow yeah. we would have the same situation that we have on our hands now. So, so, so in what kind this of is one of the, This is one of the things I say mm -hmm. that I believe that every society at every point have the right to re envision society in their image. Mm -hmm. And that the fact that in 25 years or 30 or 50 years from now, the younger Ghanaians or different Ghanaians of a generation will be having a rethink of a constitution we would have put in place, is actually fair. That's what society is, is about. But one of the things I have been shy about, even putting ideas of the content, I have strong ideas about even the content of a constitution. I've said some of these things. But I believe that there are so many different groups with different ideas about constitutional change. Once we all agree and we create and, a constituent and, and assembly, interest. okay? We can then, it's a marketplace of ideas. We can then debate these ideas, compete these ideas. That's the process I'm saying that we need a constituent assembly mm -hmm. to reflect on these issues. And that I don't believe the framework we have tried, that I was part of, yeah. isn't even workable. It creates an elite driven process. And the reason why I know this is that even when we're doing the constitutional amendment process, even if there was certain overwhelming, we think that this was the best thing, this is what Ghanaians were clamoring for. Persons would then say, yeah, but are the politicians going to accept this? Mm -hmm. And for which reason they water it down further, and the one that will be palatable to the government in place. So, so if you understand you very well on this issue of a new constitution, yeah. what you are saying essentially is that there must be some sort of consensus or general agreement yes. that we need a new one, yeah. and then we'll take ideas as to how Absolutely. exactly that must be done. Absolutely. And one of the things we said from the beginning when we put the 1992 constitution in place is that we all agree that it wasn't what we're going to use for the long road ahead. We said that we needed to transition into democracy. Mm -hmm. But then we have to think about the constitution again. But, but, but I, I seem to really subscribe more to the arguments mm -hmm. by uh, the KPMG professor of accounting and uh, fellow, uh, Professor Kukwasa. Yeah. That you seem to have this optimism an, an unfounded one i would add yeah. for the, the 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 new structure or document that you would have to replace the current one okay. because what i think that is to solve all our problems yeah, that, yeah because, no, it won't. because i think that you don't account for personal idiosyncrasies and issues of discussion for instance that the constitution would never be able to i agree capture everything i agree one of the things i've said to we have Kukua, sorry. you're not going to have any solution there one of the things i've said to Kukua, sorry, is that as an activist I want a constitution as my ally. Mm -hmm. I don't find that enough in this constitution. That I, well, if, we, we, if the assumptions that underline the current constitution about institutions that are going to check themselves are not yeah. working and cast people out of the process, then it's going to be difficult. So at least I want a document, if yeah. nothing at all, that gives people much more an in into the process. Yeah, and, and like is, it's my ally in the struggle. And that's where your place in this whole discourse is very important. Mm -hmm. Because when you say that as an activist, this doesn't appear to be the sort of ally that you want. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining that in the very, the most conservative of minds, mm -hmm. right, for people, and again, that's why for me, when it comes to issues of power, 
we need not to only look at what is aspirational or what is good, yeah. but we need to also look at interests of other people. So yeah. for, for, for the most conservative of minds yeah. who find some relative peace for themselves, yeah. because here you're personalizing it and talking about yourself as an activist here, yeah. for those people, they would obviously take exception to this drive and demand for a new one. Mm. And if you recognize that their individual position and perspective on this is as important yeah. as yours, then we hit a de deadlock. Okay. So this is the thing. The people who believe that, no, the constitu current constitution is fine, we should leave it. The people who think that a few textual amendments here and there is what we need. Okay. And the people like myself who think that we need to rethink the framework of gov government. Now, one of the things I have said is that, okay, these are all different ideas on the table. But what I am not seeing is people who are being active citizens using this document. Mm -hmm. And even as I've been the Constitution's biggest critic, I've been one person who's used it the most. Yeah. Like, I genuinely believe that that's what we have, and I'm going to continue to use it. So I want all those people who are on the sidelines, who believe that they believe in the current Constitution, to show me its full potential. Speak up, join the cause for, for, for democratic reform, accountability, and all of that. Because even as I am talking about we needed a new one, I haven't poo pooed it and say that, no, if I go to court, I'm never going to rely on the Constitution, or that I'm not going to use its principles in my advocacy. I talk about it all the time. So the use of the Constitution ultimately is important to me. And if I'm getting people to be so passionate about the process, I want them to be passionate about really bringing the Constitution to life. And that's what I am doing. And every step we are taking, i give you an example, that we are showing people so many ways in which the Constitution can be used uh, to trigger reform to hold account. We are doing that now, making a, bringing the constitution to life. And I'm saying that, okay, let's just take the language of those who say we need sexual amendments here and there. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of Ghanaians believe that the constitution needs to uh, the second look at. That's the kind of sense we get. Yeah. But there are people who are not, especially persons who this works for, who are in power, who this does not work for, who would join that language about the yeah, amendments here and there, but would never take the initiative. Look at the example you've created. Like, since we started talking about new constitution, people say, like, no, we don't need it. We need a serious amendment. Persons in the political class, what have they done so far? Towards their belief in that. They have all the power. Mm -hmm. What have they done? They have done nothing. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes a language of, you know, cutting and breaking any activism about rethinking a status quo. And that's all they engage in. Because they said, why don't you talk about amendments instead? So, okay, you are talking about amendments. You have the power. Why are you power? not initiating it? But also, there's, there's a problem here. And for me, that's why mm. the, usually the, the, the fundamental questions of, of ideology, of philosophy, are very important to me. Yeah. Because in this majoritarian democracy, winner takes all approach that we have, even in, in, in imagining a new constitution, I do not see, for instance, how sexual minorities or gender, um, I mean, uh, yes, sexual minorities are going to have the sort of representation that you want. Because ultimately, yeah. for the constitution to pass, the people must accept it. Yeah. And I do not imagine how even, and, and that's why I am not able to attach such significance yeah. and op optimism that you attach to okay. this. Because ultimately, I, yeah. I, I don't see how, when the psyche, yeah. the general orientation and consciousness is what it is today, and yeah. education has not changed then I, I imagine that you're putting the cat before the horse. Okay. So, I mean, this is a fair point. I think that I am frustrated as well by the fact that we've created a 30-year democracy where 86% of Ghanaians say they've never even seen the constitution before. And we've had to have an institution that is charged exclusively with that business. Okay. So I understand the ways in which persons in power have little interest or having a, a rambunctious or, you know, citizens who are, uh, you know, really committed to the process of holding them to account. But I don't think it should be an either-or conversation. We can create a framework that teases out the potential for them. And I, I worry about how we protect minorities as well. Mm -hmm. But I think that we can imagine... You see, this is a thing I ask ourselves. What are, why are we amending the constitution? What are we trying to create? Yeah. That it is possible. Like in other countries, where, like in general Europe, where smaller groups like the, the Greens yeah, and other, yeah. other small, who are interested in you know, social issues which have not been able to cross over into the, poli into the, in the critical mass of people still are able to find representation and influence policy mm -hmm. are doing so because are, there's a political system that allows for minority expression. Yes. Like even today now, it would have been possible for a lot of people who ask for the country to, to join the electoral competition and contest for election. If you have proportional representation, we can have that and have a certain vote and find representation in parliament. 
With the current structure, we can't find it. But, but Oliver, what achieves that? And that would be my last bit on the on the constitution yeah. element. What proportional representation? Yeah, but it, what let me give an example. It, it requires first a certain not necessarily and acceptance mm. that this alternative approach will yield better outcomes for all. So, mm. so I'm interested in how do you get people to buy into it? Yeah. So we had, but, but yeah, thing I understand that. Like, that, for instance, right, I don't think, a lot of people have told me that, yeah, we need to change the constitution. We don't think the current political class mm -hmm. can do it uh, suf sufficiently. What we have done is that we said we want one million signatures mm -hmm. in, 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 in for a new constitution. Yeah. And in that, we've created for ourselves a commitment that would have at least spoken to one million people and convinced them of this. That's a goal mm -hmm. of civic edification. Okay? So that's a that's a process of you know, directly engaging people and having conversations with people. We could have said we want a thousand votes, which we would have long surpassed in a few days, yeah. and whatever it is, which would have been more than, you know. But we set ourselves a million citizens and say we're going to continue to have conversation with them, and we're going to surprise a million, sure. But it sets a conversation, a framework for engagement, and we believe that it has to be a long-term goal. Yeah. We believe that because obviously, uh, I, I I worry about you say uh, of constitutional amendment or constitutional conversations yeah. by persons who are only committed to how can I amass something for, something for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And for us, this is a process of education. And mm -hmm. that's why we've... We, it doesn't mean that because no, we I want mean, to educate, I, I, we I can't mean, give people a goal yeah. to us. I, I really do appreciate the, 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 the discourse. And for me, if not for anything at all, the fact that there's, there's something to talk about. Because mm -hmm. we, we, when we interact, my, my, my background foundation is in sociology. Absolutely. Special interactions, for me, are proven to be the, the best because... Yeah. We change our views. Yeah. Even the most recalcitrant of people, they'll pick something. And or they have a reason to justify their recalcitrance. And it. that's fine. At yes. least it's intellectual. Yes. So, so let's, talk, let's talk about we, the Ghanaian people, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Human rights, prosperity. Yeah. Because that's also at the point, at the, at the heart of this whole enterprise that we are, we are involved in. Yeah. Let's start on this very recent uh, issue. And here, I'd invoke the, the Nigerian professor of political science, Peter Ike, yeah. in his very, very seminar work. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, colonialism and the two publics in Africa, where he talks about the fact that because of the, the period of colonialism mm -hmm. and the body of morality, legal regime, and institutions that he created, and again, given the fact that that has not entirely overtaken or overruled the, what he puts as the primordial moral system that we have, which is to say the traditional system, we have a situation of a, of a conflict. And at some point, we don't know what exactly it is that we are doing. So take Kloxag and their demand for neutrality allowance. Right. The sense I get from that, because many people think that, oh, it's about yeah. money. You, don't, you, don't, yeah. you deserve it or you don't deserve that. Mm. What I see... Is a group of people who view the state as a distant entity from which we are all yeah. picking from. Right. And so, if the political class yeah. have more access and are benefiting, yeah. we must. But if we can't, then you must, I mean, appease us for our inability to flee from this entity called state. And when we take it, it's something for me that that defines all of these problems. I don't know how you, 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 you react to that. Listen, I think it was Du Bois who was talking about, right? I, I, I prefer to say Du Bois. Du Bois. <laughs> I know it's <laughs> French, I said Du Bois, I said Du Bois. I think about the double consciousness. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a lot, a, a lot of language. I was reading a lot of Steve Biko when I was in, in cell about what essentially the, the black man is divided onto himself. Mm -hmm. It's like we're living a conflict yes. of, of, of ourselves in southern, I think. You're describing some of those internal conflicts that we're yeah. dealing with. Um, I wonder if we go into the traditional setting, whether or not Asantis would look at that the kingdom and the state as something to extract from for ourselves, or that they feel a sense of we are working collectively for this good. What a unitary. Yeah. And I think of that ugly state, I think of all those other ones. I wonder if they have the feeling about it. I, I, I don't think I don't get that sense. So too, I don't get that sense, right? Yes. So perhaps there's something artificial about this project Ghana mm -hmm. that we are not sufficiently dealt with its artificial nature, yes. and that the way in which Nkrumah and others did it is that let's forget about all the others and just create a Ghanaian unity or mindset yeah. without knowing that it's a it's a journey towards that. Yeah, because this is something that the likes mm -hmm. of um, I mean Naomi Kazan, yeah. um, 
yeah. uh, Pierre Engelbert, yeah. and many others who have yeah. written on Africa have said yeah. that immediately post-colonial Africa. Yeah, there was the, a real the, sense yes, of... Yes, and, and, and a friction between traditional authority because yeah. for them, they did not imagine that the new yeah. class of people, civil yeah. service, who have worked with the colonialists, yeah. are going to be the new leaders. So they preferred a reversion to yeah. the pre-colonial order. Yeah. And it appears that the remnants of that are still in here uh, t today. Yeah, I mean, in, in fact, the, the, the whole class we created in the, in the colony was a supplant, right? Like, they, were, they weren't... There was a whole new class of people who came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. That the, the, It's like the Vichy regime in, in, in France, where the Germans had created a, a position and left them in charge, and then can go on and fight their battles. That's essentially which the new class of people we created this. But it's in fact, it's a sense of a, we are a colonized people. You know, that colonial legacies legacy continue to live with us in the way in which we haven't developed our societies and built a tradition. And that is, so it's not a, a nation yeah. state. It's not a nation state in the sense in which we understand the way yeah. where the nation has formed. But that is a person which have a conglomeration of different people. Mm -hmm. But it's worked in other places. Take America, for instance. Mm -hmm. America is by no direction any of the nation states of the European, the French, or the Spanish, it's none, it's none of that. But it's working through the it's different diversities been able to create has, has a it, system has of it, government. It really? Aren't but, you being too charitable with American economic, project, economic, call it that, that it, Let's talk about economically. They've been able to provide economic liberation for so many. Of course, there are certain persons in American society of a particular, have, particular, of a particular identity, yeah, of a particular yes. identity black people, yes. who, have been, who bear the burden of America's greatness yes. today, and that they were able to have access to the cheap labor yes. for so many years. But they've created a democratic system that, that works. That when we saw, uh, how do you call it, Trump try what he did, that the system responded to after centuries. Now, think about Ghana. The black woman at the Supreme think, Court. think about Ghana, right? Yes. No, yeah, it lives with this contradiction, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things which I disagree with Kukuaza, for instance, when, because he likes to, you know, fondly reminisce about the American Constitution and how it has been aged. But Thurgood Marshall on the American Supreme Court said something that our Constitution is not perfect. It has lived through a civil war and slavery. Today, it's been forced through a civil war, mm -hmm. right? Like, so those contradictions exist in American society as well. But there's a certain guarantee of prosperity, and that there's certain things that the civic minded people in America will not count on. I see. Hold on briefly for me. Uh, you're making a point about the, the American situation and how you, you, you disagree with uh, the very kind way that the likes of uh, Professor Kukwasari, for instance, mm. talk about it. Mm. Yeah, and I was talking about Tagud Marshall saying that, you know, the American constitution has survived, you know, slavery and, and, and a civil war to get to where it is. And it's not, it's not for nothing, right? Like, no perfect society. But it asks whether there's a genuine soul that is guiding the, the country towards something. Yeah. Can we say that for our country? That's one of the things I'm, I think about consistently. Mm. So we can have and reflect on this, the fact that there have been historical problems that we have to deal with. But as to whether or not we have the humility in saying that something is not working mm -hmm. and that we need to have that conversation to re-centralize re ourselves towards creating something, a project that Ghanaians can believe in. Mm. That's for me is the biggest thing. I see. A sense of belief we don't yeah. have. Uh, we'll be wrapping up very shortly, but, but I want us to talk about this a bit about rights. Because we we can't wrap up without talking about the media, so let's no, talk about no, rights we'll, and talk we'll about the talk media about as well. That, don't worry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ours is a very paternalistic society. Yeah. Others also call it a very neo-patrimonial uh, system. So it means that the buck eventually stops with the president. And for me, it creates a certain conflict. Mm. Because whilst I would want a situation where the president would stay far away from issues as possible, mm. The nature of our political system, even a tradition where we appeal to authority and leadership means that we cannot also entirely take him out. I have a reason, after a very long time, when almost at every point in time when we're talking about our current president, mm -hmm. we associate him with human rights lawyer and all of those things. I, I believe now that that's a facade. He's yeah. not anymore a human rights activist than like any, been... other, any other person, right? Because, I mean, it's not enough that because you have participated some time ago, in acts that sort of consolidate the, the democratic gains of this country. You're going to perpetually benefit from that. When now you are in a position where you could affect that even more, but you are not. So I'm wondering, in ensuring that the rights of citizens are protected and, and, and safeguarded, what do we look towards? Yeah. That we should call on the president and call him out to, to speak on some of these matters, or that we should completely disregard him 
and then focus on other institutions? Which one works really within the context of the Ghanaian situation? I think that if you build hope in the presidency, you would have lost the plot. I think that, and I agree with you, I have, you know, in my civil service career, I see the way in which Ghanaians act around authority. Persons who even outside are seemingly, you know, creating a sense of being vocal and kind of create a certain sense of belief of standing up. And the way in which they, they disentangle within the authority of the seat of presidency and all of that. That I genuinely believe, and this is one of the questions I ask people about the ideas around a new constitution. That we have a constitution that appeals to our worst impulses or that acts against it. There are certain things that we think that there's a societal drive towards. Rules must help check them. I think that we are persons who are genuinely always trying to create a dictatorial system, right? Pers and it perhaps it comes from the traditional system because we haven't we hadn't yet democratized our traditional institutions in a way in which it had happened through the French Revolution and you know in England. Yeah when it was you know, cut short by colonization. So we hadn't yet achieved it. And when we were coming back to really to go back to it, we had a nostalgia of it that we didn't think of it as an institution that needed room to grow. We wanted to calcify it and stop it in its tracks. Yeah. And our whole legal system is, is creating that it has to be this way. Mm -hmm. So I believe that in, in putting in place a certain set of arrangements, yeah. it has to be one that anticipates the kind of people we are and, 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 and ties us better. That it must guide us as well as uh, you know moving along with it. An example is the fact that there's been so many cases in our courts where people say in our tradition, the way you get married that you have to kidnap the woman and keep mm -hmm. her in your room for days, mm -hmm. and that's the way in which you get married to the person. Yeah. A way to be said that's the way people's way of life. Why not you know let law conform to it? But no, law comes in and says yeah. we are based on the principle of you know, individual autonomy. And I said, I talked about being libertarian on certain issues, that they believe in absolute freedom of the individual, that we have only agreed to give certain parts of that freedom to this thing called the government, right? So I think that's the, the, the reason why I struggle with a constitution that is permissive yeah. than, rather than checks. Knowing the person's instinct is always driven towards concentrating power, yeah. concentrating power in an individual. Like even, for instance, now, a bigger problem about democracy is not just the power the constitution confers on the president, but how much parliament has given to the president. Mm -hmm. Parliament has now given the president the power to rule by decree through the imposition of restrictions act. They've essentially made themselves like a doormat. Yes. And, and, and we are currently, the country is currently challenging this in the Supreme Court. Right? And so if you look at our advocacy, it's, about, it's against the idea of an overwhelming presidency with persons with powers that can do anything. In fact, against the clamor of people who think that the Ghana democracy is not suited for, for Ghana and countries like this, and that we need a strong man and persons like that. And as I say, you guys, you forget that we've had an auto authoritarian and autocratic past, that I don't get where this nostalgia keeps coming from. So my instinct is continuing to keep that in check and give people more ways to be able to hold institutions to account. Why do you think we seem too disinterested? I mean, I've attempted to explain using Peter Ike and you have talked yeah. about uh, Dubois and uh, Steve Biko and many others like that. But if you, if you look at Sal hmm. and the situation that we have on our hands now, that there are people in a, in a supposed representative democracy yeah. who have not had a representation, yeah. but it doesn't prick the conscience of anyone, including, and again, I'll go back to the very paternalistic new patrimonial yeah. system that we have, and a human rights president. Yeah. He should be fuming, yeah. but he's not. Citizens uh, has he been spoken on it? I don't think I he don't, has. I don't remember. That. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is uh, one of the reasons why I disagree. Uh, that, ultimately, that he's uh, a human rights president. I think not a case. Also. Yeah, of course, they're, they're interested in that. Like, let's, let's think about it. I've looked at this guy's journey. All the times Nanadu has gone to court, he's gone to court for the MPP. And we said the right of the MPP to be represented, to have access, equal access. We can think about it as opening up society. Yeah. But in fact, he's thinking about political opening for himself or he's never gone to court in his past life on just a human rights issue that was disconnected from his politics i don't i think i don't think so i've, I've looked at it and i don't know where the attack of human rights advocate comes from like you can think of francis Avis who spent his time yeah. thinking about prisoner rights and mm -hmm. i can think of that as a human rights advocate but I haven't seen that from his own yeah, yeah, we, we, life. Because, because but we can talk about, yes, all those things incidentally add to it. Like if you mash that we need a democracy and show that we need multi partisan politics which you can create your own party and contest for presidency. Yeah. Perhaps you're using the language, you're only 
using the language to push an end of projecting yourself to power. And that's why a lot of people believe that his end goal has always been to president. That when he became president, he's like, you yeah. know, F everything. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't like to make it really about him per se, but yeah. it, it worries me that something as fundamental yeah. as representation, yeah. if we believe in everything that we yeah. talk about and all of that, that f since the last election, yeah. And this is what the, the second year that we are in yeah. a group of people have four communities yes. have no representation, yes. and now we have added one, even if it, it is for a second. Yeah. The, the principles must yeah. matter. Yeah. I, 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 I don't Listen, know. there are certain people who <laughs> believe that, in fact, and all my advocacy, the one that even worried the system is the fact that we have called for, we are working on the impeachment mm -hmm. of the electoral commissioner, mm -hmm. that called the system to want to even arrest you more. That, yes, that's just, and that problem is that. I haven't talked about it. And it, actually, today we were writing to the Chief Justice on. I was over the weekend, we were writing to the Chief Justice on the matter because he's taking certain steps we disagree with. Mm -hmm. But now they've decided that even if you speak about it publicly, his grounds do not deal with it. And I don't want to give them a reason not to talk about it, yeah. deal with it. But I think that somebody must pay the ultimate price for this thing. And I genuinely believe, unlike people who think that perhaps it's accidental, I think that it's by design. Mm -hmm. That the real design was to get the MPP. Uh, a, par a parliamentary candidate in the voter region. And the way you do it is through gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And that if that didn't, couldn't pass through parliament, yes. you have to, the last minute, on the day before the vote, stop a community from voting. I genuinely believe that's what, what's happened. And that's criminal in itself. I'm look at but who's going to investigate? I, I, I the, minister of, the minister of Justice and Attorney General is not going to investigate. It's part of the mess. But why are we not angry? We are the people not angry ourselves. I don't understand it, but I, this is one of the things I keep telling you that I don't want to look people, I want to think about liberating myself first. That when I... I get disappointed in the overwhelming majority of Ghanaians forever, because, and then that would even disable me from doing anything. I think it's, it's, it's as, as grave a sin as I think possible so too. if we, we, we at least even pretend that, that we, 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 we love this democracy. Mm. But, but final point on this, w what are your thoughts on, on what some call a um, very good friend that I found on social media, uh, in, uh, Nikoi uh, Kote, yeah. the loyification of discourse in Ghana? Oh my goodness, listen, I have talked so many times, <laughs> that reminds me of something. I saw a comment, I saw a post by some lawyer calling for Andrea Usu, no, no, Sophia Odo, to be arrested because of sex and clothing. And I went to write a lawyer for any Jimmy, it means that lawyers are always fully. Because yeah. I'm always very critical of the legal profession and law itself, and I've, I've talked about so many times where I'm even ashamed of the fact that I'm a lawyer. Yeah. Because somebody might think that I'm only doing this because I'm a lawyer. I think we have to imagine the Republic beyond lawyers. Unfortunately, a lot of times when we are even having public discourse, we want to bring lawyers in. Mm -hmm. Even when we are talking about the constitutional questions, yes. they want to talk to lawyers, forgetting that the constitution is a political document. And they don't like to also talk about principles that back anything. It is just a regurgitation. In Absolutely. My mind, I, I, I find Absolutely. the majority of lawyers, I, I see them the same way I see ruminants. Absolutely. Because uh, just, that's the legal training just, in Ghana. just reproduce whatever it is that they... That's the legal training in Ghana. You cannot think differently for yourself. I had the biggest problems in law school. Like, I had so much problems because I, I wanted to talk about why. And that was something that was uh, unused to. Like, I was called a troublemaker. I was called about, hey, this guy. Like, there was always a sense of... It's about traditions. Like, there's a certain... Ceremony, ceremony. Yeah, like, even when I said that, look at the Ghana Bar Association. Yes. Knowing that there was a problem with how you know, uh, commercial transport workers were being treated by the police and all mm -hmm. of that. What do they do? They create for themselves a sticker, which they put on the on their cars, which the police don't stop them. They create uh, some sort of... Yeah, they create you know, something for themselves, right? There's a back group for themselves that they don't deal with it. And when I talked about, you know, I was going to reprint the Ghana bus tickets and give it to trucker drivers mm -hmm. across the country, people were like, oh, why are you doing that? Lawyers who are seemingly progressive said that, no, 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 what would that achieve? Would I... And I, I just laugh at it, right? You saw the same thing that happened with the admissions to the Ghana School of Law. We've been talking about the problems of access. Yes. Persons within our within the judiciary, yes. the current president of the Bar Association, mm -hmm. persons within that establishment council. decided that they their children who had failed the entrance exam should be given protocol admissions. Look at the Ghan this is the ethic of the Ghanaian and, and, and then there was a point class. that the the um, I don't know if it's passed now, the who was acting as uh, um, Mr. Maxwell of Okuajiman, yeah. said that even by the admission of one of the students, yeah. a, an entire block Just of, of, this, so of a university, of a public university, university was and, given to them. And I could not imagine... This I is mean, the he, underhand he dealing my, that under... He attended, we attended the same school, and yeah. I've gone to uh, annual parties <laughs> in, in his house a few times, and I, and I respect him. Yeah. But I find that 
not just problematic, I find it extremely unintelligent to, that, that, to concede that for a public institution, yeah. a building was released yeah. just to trade for favor for somebody. Yeah. And this is an institution that prides itself yeah. as being bastions and, 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 and a safeguarding yeah. the, the entire no. legal, legal institution. There's a, there's, a, there's a real facade going on. The persons who have understood that the vast majority of our people do not care. They do not get angry at even Sal. Mm -hmm. They are not going to do anything. And for which reason we can get away with anything. But let's talk about the media then. Yes. Because, I mean, that's the, 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 the place I come from. Yeah. But even as a practitioner myself, I am, I am aware of how complicit the media is. Yes. And... And, but again, when it comes to discussing the media and its role, I also sometimes find that people like you and many others that who criticize the media do it from a place of, of, of ignorance, really. Yeah. Because we assume that somehow everybody in the media would recognize their yeah. role yeah. and would act outside of themselves. Yeah. The people in the media precisely the same people that you find in the courts you find yeah. a teaching you find in the market yeah. so we're from this expectation yeah. that somehow the media would act differently yeah in my whole advocacy the people i talk less about are chiefs okay i talk less about institutions that i have i have expectations of little expectations of or you have expectations i have little i talk little about the institutions that i have no expectations mm -hmm. from and more about those that I have more expectations of. I have more expectations of the media. Mm -hmm. And I think that they can make this country beautiful. I think that they can really safeguard our democracy. What do you think the problem is? Okay. Now, a lot of the times, unfortunately, I've seen uh, Manasi Azure, for instance, have written about the media come and say that it, literally it's some of them that has kept me alive mm -hmm. because they've spoken out against it. I think you mentioned Nico, and Nico took a lot of exceptions yeah. to that. Um, I, I am hoping that in the same way when feminist advocates talk about men are trash, mm -hmm. that men who are allies understand that we shouldn't come and be now be yeah. saying that not all men. Yeah. Do you understand? Yes. So that there are certain people within the media space who have made it them, themselves that they are going to put their voices behind, you know, democratic reforms. And they're doing that. There's so many of them in the space. And then when we criticize the media, we're talking about the fact that those people are isolated and there's not a critical mass of people who are committed to doing that as well. Mm -hmm. But I also don't want to say that because there are so many, they are a reflection of our general society and there's so many people who are going to be timid, so many people who are going to be in bed with the status, the status quo, there are so many people who don't care, just want the paycheck, that it's naive to even expect more. Like I, I say it because I have expectations mm -hmm. and I hope that somebody there would conscience will be pregnant and be like, ah, ah, maybe I can be a little bolder on this other issue. Mm -hmm. It's just that mm, minute minute of crisis where the person says, maybe I should do this different. That's all I'm hoping for. And that's why I'm critical of the media. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that we can have a media space where everybody would not be praised, like people, a lot of people are not going to be praised sing singers of the status quo. But when you have certain democracies, there's a critical masses of certain voices. Yeah. There's a critical core of people that you know you can look to for direction and that's what i'm looking for and oh. i believe that that belief can be created and the yes. persons within the media yourself included who i think that can have that perspective and can play that leading role but the framework has to exist and you have to have a sense of support from persons like myself mm -hmm. and persons in general civil society who are providing ourselves out that support yeah. and the more you speak i speak on these issues the more you also feel emboldened that a certain kind of journalism there's an appetite for a certain kind of journalism yeah. And we find ourselves, I think. That's, that's why I do. Again, I it comes back to, to, to discourse. So, to so still on this then, because I made this point, I think that was yesterday. Yeah. Or, no, um, or maybe I think this was on Tuesday. And so, my colleague, whilst we were doing this review, raised the point about what I think about this whole Sewa Bruni affair. Yeah. And at a point, I, I thought about it, and, and then I, I, I made this revelation that somehow I have just deliberately stayed away from that subject, yeah. and, and I have only once, this was in October last year, yeah. when I was in Sunyane, and that was because I was even idle, that I watched a video yeah. of the woman narrating, say, narrating some of the issues. So I don't even, I, I can't even find what I watched. Yeah. But the point I was making then was that I have now begun to ask myself, why, why is it that, I mean, what's this point of restraint coming from? 
I mean, I don't consider myself significant in yeah. the grand scheme yeah. for anybody to be interested in my opinion or yeah. want to hurt me or anything like that. Yeah. But, but you just, have a sense of restraint about it. I have a sense of restraint. Yeah. And I have a sense also and believe that that is precisely the same thing for many other people. Mm -hmm. Ordinarily, if journalists thought that this was not an important matter because in the Ghanaian scheme of things, we have more important things to talk about, I could understand. Mm -hmm. But we have had this conversation before. Yes. You know, I've talked about even more trivial issues yes. before. Yes. On this, you have said that the president should be impeached yes. for his role in the or for the allegations yeah. against him. You know, there's you a your, your, your restraint comes from a certain ethic about middle class Ghanaians, where there's a issues around you know extramarital affairs of the presidency. So no, you know we have we are con even conservatively. Even when I look at myself, I know that ordinarily, because of the nature of the the, of the problem here, yeah. I, I just believe that if it were someone else. I would, I would. Right, we're looking for the perfect victim. Because, because it's not even about the conservative marital yeah. issues for me. It's about discretion. Because when the Kandapa situation came up, yeah. even though it was a personal issue of sex, sexual gratification, yeah. I spoke about it because I would not have somebody like that yeah. with just low recognition yeah. for, for his own position to be in a place as sensitive as national security. So, yeah. so I talked about that. But I've not talked about the president's own, and I don't know why. I okay. I, I can only talk about how toward so many people have told me mm -hmm. that a lot of people are afraid. Some so many people said that a lot of journalists have talked about. Listen, you guys call upon us to go and speak, and when Ahmed Swale is killed, like the whole country does not erupt. I actually believe that if Anas An Anas Arimiyao is killed today, Ghanaians are not going to go onto the streets in their numbers. I don't think so too. I don't think so too. I had somebody a journalist journalist telling me. Uh, I, I I don't want to mention her name now. Telling me that, oh, if something happened to you, I think the Ghanaians would have been fed up and Ghanaians would march onto the street. And I said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it for a second. The people, that becomes examples of why I have to be watchful of my back. But, but, but would it be fair also to say the president, to, to think and assume that that, that may, because I mean, if we, if we, what, what, what have we doubt? Okay, let's take this. So I'm him. for those who don't know about, this is the lady who has talked about and has videos and pictures to prove it, that she's had uh, extramarital affairs with the president and that beyond that the president went on to use the national security to retrieve uh, compromising pictures of him and videos of him and by staging an armed robbery on her and i have talked about i've tried to i have never talked about all this i don't care about what the president does in his private time or whatever again as a libertarian listen people can have all kinds yeah. of sexual relations and i don't care about the but the bigger thing is that the president i don't care about if the you, president's you morality state, you state resources for instance when you use state resources to stage an armed robbery against a citizen which could have resulted in the person dying. In fact, she has talked about in the last conversation that she's been told that they would have killed her and that if they knew this was going to happen, they would have just off her. And would have reported it as, oh, Ghanaian Canadian killed in a field arm robbery and, attack. Estranged. Right. Woman. <laughs> you know, we'd have, even at the time that the incident happened, we didn't know of her relationship because she hadn't gone public yeah. on it at the time. This person has gone on to the, and I've talked about going on to the, to the police, the, uh, the head, the head the director of CID. Yeah. And the director of CID said, oh, when you meet the president, tell him that we are doing a good job. That's, that was a response. Today, the police claim that they have the docket. They've done nothing about it. If the police are fearful of investigating the president. And I believe this. Because when the president breached COVID-19 rules in a disproportionate manner, and I made an official police complaint, the police said because the, police, the president's name is mentioned in the complaint, they cannot touch it. We should go and remove the president's name. In fact, the first claim that they have lost it, after a year, almost a year, and we sent it back, and they're, they're claiming this now, and I said they should put it in writing, because I want to go to court on it. Even though our constitution has given the president immunity while he's in office, it says he can be tried only within the first three years after he leaves office for wrong done while he was in office. Yeah. It doesn't mean that he, the president, the police must investigate the crime mm. and prepare to prosecute if there's grounds to prosecute. Mm. So this way in which our, even our institutions, nobody wants to touch it because it's the president, is the fear of the fact that we don't have a democracy. But, but to be fair, though, and that's the last bit on this, uh, is that a problem of, say, Nanar Danko Kofado? Or that's a problem of all persons, which means that if Oliver yeah. were president tomorrow, yeah. this will be the same reaction. Listen, I went to, I went to, the, I went to, the, I went to a Boise and I was interviewed by one of the local stations and yeah. I said, we have created a system where even Jesus put in place will be corrupt mm -hmm. because we've allowed it. In fact, when I made a complaint to the police, the media called me, uh, Ivan uh, Spencer, yeah. saying, is it realistic to call for the president that's and the uh, chief justice? Yes, <laughs> uh, chief justice. And this thing, is it, 
and I'm thinking, I'm like, what do you mean is it realistic? Mm -hmm. Like, the, for, for something which is of a less graver uh, effect than what happened, Boris Johnson has just been fired by the police mm -hmm. in London. He's gone to the nation and apologized twice. None of that has happened. If we are making excuses for, for, for leadership and saying that is it realistic to expect them to be punished, then what kind of democratic system are we creating? So I believe that this president has weaponized the system that we have left into his hands. And any president left in that situation could, yes. could do worse things to our democracy. He has made it, taken into dramatic proportions, but it can even get worse. Mm. And that's my, my fear for, for what can happen to our democracy. So, yeah, so I believe he must be impeached for this. Because, and I say he must be impeached because I want to show people that there's a democratic option that exists in our constituents, constitution. And it's not for a military overthrow for, the, for what the president is doing to our democracy, but that the parliament can impeach this individual. And that we have to look, whenever there's a problem in our democracy, we have to look at democratic options to fix it. And that this presidency, for the fact that he has weaponized our national security, must be impeached. Oliver, just before we go, um, two quick ones, and, and then we, we run out on, on that. First is to ask you the question if you are tired already. Yeah. And I'm asking that because of something that you yourself put out on Facebook. You yeah. said, quote, I thought about writing a post about this, and, and, and but when I'm done, you would know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know exactly. And then you about. continue that, then it dawned on me that the people who come here to insult me will not be the lawyers who will be making money off the backs of you poor pe uh, Ghanaians. It will be the Ghanaians we speak for. I closed Facebook, went to YouTube to watch cut videos. I hated myself for my silence, but we're only human. Are you tired already? So you see, one of the things I've always talked to people, and this is not the first time I've kind of talked about, I, one, I always want to be as honest with people, because people think that because we are speaking up, we are superhuman, mm -hmm. and that we can do it because we have no fear and that they, are they shouldn't do. I want to show them that we live with the same fears as well. We live the same you know, anxieties as well. We live with the same worries as well. But yet we do this. And that means there has to, I want to, de you know, to personalize myself rather than create a cold sense around myself as a person who fears nothing and, you know. And that's one of the reasons why I'm always very open about it. So I'm going to choose to do the things I'm doing anyway, but I want people to know that the times when we also have doubt. Mm. The times when we have to be humanized and understand that we are not superhuman. So yes, I'm go I've, got, I've gotten tired so many times. Okay. There's so many things I could have done differently. There's so many things I could have done more. But I wish there were more people doing the work. Even Christ said, say, I mean, there's a, the work is big, but the, 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 the laborers or the persons who are supposed to do the work are few. We all have that sense. And I do hope that there's a lot more people who are coming up. And I want them to understand when you do come up that there are going to be moments where they are going to be tired and jaded. But you have to push on nonetheless. Here's what Dr. Kobe Mensah of the University of Ghana uh, Business School. He's a political communications uh, uh, expert. Yeah. In an interview with um, Evans Mensah of Joy News, said mm. this, that, um, quote, um, so I'll, I'll just paraphrase. In mm. his words, he says that you seem to be cultivating yourself as an alternative to the leadership that we have today. And in his words, here I'll quote exactly, that you are presenting yourself, quote, as new leadership. Is that something you are doing? And, and by that, I mean, given that the ultimate is to become president in this country for many people, is that something that you have plans to? So I, I, I am appreciative of those words. I think that we are cultivating an idea of new leadership because we want to create a vision of people to say that we cannot continue to live like this. And it's not that the ideal of leadership should not be an, 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 a person but it has to be in a collective value system. Mm -hmm. And it's that a lot of what we are saying and a lot of things we're saying is giving people the view that we are creating a, an, a, an alternative way of how we can be leaders. And I think that that's exactly what we are doing. I think that a lot of young people need to brace this new vision for, you, for themselves for alternatively. Now, I started this thing. I said, even if it's the country, I said I was an accidental convener. Um, I do not see myself running for office in 2024, as a lot of people are saying. And I don't know if I'm ever going to run for office. My preference would be not to. My okay. preference, I'm a person who is much more policy driven because I feel like I, I want much more time to think. You want to be a Gabby? There's a lot more running around and kissing babies and baby hands. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see that he does that role. I don't see which policy is. No, no, He's mean, champion. He's not champion of healthcare. And, and, no, and not, no, 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 no. That's, that's persons who want to say that they want to be controlling things from behind for nefarious purposes of enriching themselves. I want persons who are identified as they left the cause for universal health care. They left the, 
this thing for you know the more like policy driven things like I, i'd rather be interested in that role i actually have not made shy of i have ambitions of yes I, I want to be chief justice of this country because i think the legal profession needs reform as well i want to be a journalist there's so many things i i want to be right but i i don't i don't think that the presidency is anything anybody can can make a career of and, and aim and plan for I think that in every generation there's one person who's going to be president. The most important thing is that we've created a set of new value systems that whoever becomes president embodies those values. That would be fantastic. I actually think that uh, there's a young man who's, who, who, who is in face the country, mm. Benjamin Dako. I think that he'll be an absolutely perfect president for this country. I, I think he has the right, the right instincts. He's, he's only 22, 23. He has the right instincts. He has the, the right motivations. He's a, an eagerness to learn. Mm -hmm that if this project will take hold for the next 10 years, that he might be in his early 30s, and hopefully we can have a, person, a president who is in the 30s, who will be old, and, and hopefully become part of the council of elders <laughs> who, are, who are informing the way in which the direction goes. But no, I have no personal ambitions of, of presidency, you know. Very well. On that note, uh, I want to say a very thing, a big thank you to you, uh, Oliver, Mausi, Baka, Vomawa, for accepting to a You've not added Osaji for... <laughs> Oliver, uh, we're grateful for your time and uh, we'll continue with the conversation and we'll hope that um, we don't relent in our efforts to, to make Ghana a better place for, for every other person. Thank Absolutely. You Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate awesome. this.